So my name is Amy Schmidt. I'm with the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And um, today's panel is um, called I'm an Expert. Why Aren't You Listening to Me? This panel is spon sponsored by the I Am Responsible Project, which you've probably heard us talk about in other sessions and seen information out at our booth about it. So it's a nationwide outreach program focused on sharing antimicrobial resistance education information with food producers and consumers. Throughout this, um, this project, the I Am Responsible project, you know, we started out with kind of the, the scientists um, that covered the topics we wanted to be able to share information on. And then we slowly brought in communications people who taught us how to communicate better because engineers and tech people were not super good at communication. We're not super good at dressing up the messages that we want to get out to people and, and uh, making them so that they resonate with our audiences. And so the three panelists that we've got here today are all um, experts in um, communication, in message delivery, and understanding audiences. And so they have a really interesting perspective that they can share with us about how to do a better job at those things ourselves. Um, we have three kind of goals with the session. Um, so my goal is once you walk out of here um, at the end of the session is one, that you have a better understanding of elements of successful communication that you can use in your role as a scientist or an educator. Um, two is that you're able to take what you learned today to um, design better outreach efforts in the future. And um, that you, you come away with some innovative ideas for how to um, share messages, how to design and deliver messages to your um, audiences. So I'm gonna introduce the panel. So first, Dr. Kari Nixon. Um, she's an assistant professor at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. Her research focuses on the nature of social understandings of death, disease, and community. Uh, she initially set out to be a clinical psychologist with an emphasis in data science, but then shifted to the humanities earlier in her graduate career. She's published and co-edited a number of books and other publications, including Endemic, Essays in Contagion Theory, Syphilis, and Subjectivity, Kept from All Contagion, Germ Theory, Disease, and the Dilemma of Human Contact, which was published in 2020, and um, her most recent mass market book, um, Teaching Lay Audiences, How to Critically Interpret COVID-19 Public Health Messaging, which came out just last year. Her work has also appeared in professional journals, including Disability Studies Quarterly, and Journal for Medical Humanities, among others. Our second panelist is Dr. Andy King. Um, Dr. King is an associate professor at Iowa State University, and he conducts research in strategic health, science, and risk communication, focusing on message design and campaign evaluation. His work advances applied communication, theorizing relevant to message design and message processing with the goal of contributing to improving public health through evidence-based health messages. Dr. King has published over 40 peer-reviewed journal articles and outlets, including Journal of Health Communication, Cancer Epidemiology, Risk Analysis, Journal of Communication and Health Communication, and has received research funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration and the National Institutes of Health. He serves on the editorial boards for Communication Monographs and Journal of Health Communication, and is a senior editor at Health Communication. And our third panelist is Dr. David Lansing. Um, Dr. Lansing is an associate professor in geography and environmental systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, he grew up in Wyoming and spent a lot of years in rural areas across Central America. Um, so he's witnessed all types of farming styles and livelihoods. Since 2005, his research has studied how conservation policy is formed and implemented and the effects sh such policies have on the land use decisions and livelihoods of farmers. He's conduct conducted research in Costa Rica, Honduras, Maryland, New York, and Nebraska. And um, his more recent work is focused on how very various land use stakeholders conceive of the environment, how this affects their approach towards sustainable farming practices and their relationship toward environmental regulations. He's currently undertaking this approach through a multidisciplinary project that studies changing antibiotic use practices across dairy and beef cattle industries. So welcome to our three panelists. We're thrilled that you are able to join us by Zoom. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. The way I've set up the panel, we, it's kind of, we're going to do kind of a guided discussion where we've talked about what they want to cover. You are certainly open, you know, free to ask questions as we go. 
Um, otherwise, if you want to wait until the end and ask questions, that's fine as well. So if you have a question, raise your hand and, and I'll be able to repeat it so they can hear it. Um, but we definitely want it to be a panel scenario where you can, you can ask questions of the panelists. So I'm going to start with um, uh, Dr. Nixon. And it's funny when I, well, when I met Dr. Nixon a few years ago, I've learned a lot of things from her since meeting her. Um, a lot of new terminology. I think that communication people have really like, they have much more interesting terms that they use in their work that we don't normally use. And so one of them that I remember talking about early on was scientific discourse. So um, Dr. Nixon, can you kind of explain just what do, what do we mean by scientific discourse? Yeah. Um, so I think what's interesting is that when we say scientific discourse, the thing that we're highlighting in my field is, I guess, to an extent, we're destabilizing the idea that data is key or king. Um, and of course, data does matter. But when we talk about discourse, what we're trying to do is saying that there's there's a gap to cover between getting your data and getting other people to understand it. And just continuing to, you know, spew data at people over and over, which is often seen as like, well, if we could just cover this data deficit, if we could just get them to listen to the data, then we could change people's minds or get them to listen to this information. But the discursive element, discourse, means that actually it's about how you talk about the data and how you prepare an audience to hear your data. Um, I'm sure David and Andy will be able to, you know, add to this, but um, the data deficit model has been widely debunked by most science communicators. Uh, and by that, I mean that we've found that it's not a lack of data or a, a lack of ability to understand data that is usually the problem in scientific communication. It has a lot more to do with how we're presenting it, who is presenting it, and all those things go into discourse. And so by using that word, what we're trying to do is highlight that it's about more than data. The data is what we're trying to get across, but we can't get it across unless we get the discourse right. Thank you for that. Um, so Dr. King, um, one of the things that Dr. Nixon mentioned was your audience. So knowing your audience is a very important part. Um, would you talk a little bit about how you uh, gauge your audience and therefore develop messaging based on who it is you're trying to reach? Yeah, of course. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that this discussion of audience does assume, which I just want to make sure that we highlight, is that you do have some sort of communication goal already specified so that you already know there's something you want to communicate about. But assuming that you have that, uh, the first thing you really want to think about is sort of who are your primary and secondary audiences? And I think that the the public relations professor in me wants you just to think about that as in terms of like, who are your stakeholders? Who matters to your organization? Uh, or, or who matters to your operation or whatever the situation might be. Um, and you want to know who your primary and secondary audiences are. And if you're not familiar with those terms, primary audience just me means that those are the people that you intend to get the messages and the information that you plan to disseminate publicly, um, or again, e even in private channels. Uh, and secondary audiences are the people who might end up seeing the message anyway, uh, and, and really more realistically, secondary audiences refer to the people who are likely to see the message, regardless of if you intend them to see it or not. So on college campuses, I always refer to those sort of bulletin boards that people have posted all over the place or community bulletin boards at libraries, um, as there's a, a primary audience for whatever flyer you might put up there. Uh, but the secondary audience is everyone who goes to the library or everyone who's on that building on campus. So you want to think, how can you appeal primarily to that first audience, but keep that second audience in mind? Uh, particularly if there are people in the second audience you hope to reach. Um, and then also, as you're, as you're thinking about your audience, you want to remember what information the audience needs. And there's a this is a, a complicated endeavor, obviously, but you do want to learn, if possible, uh, what the audience wants to know about whatever topic it is that you're communicating about, because you can use that uh, and, and, and you can supplement information your organization prioritizes or believe that, believes that the audience needs to know. And so that's really, I think, two important pieces about audience information needs. It's thinking about, well, what is it that they want to know? What do they need to know? And how can we sort of bring those two things together uh, in hopes that we can sort of create messaging that resonates with our audience, but also has the impact uh, and, and influences the outcomes that we want to influence. Uh, and so on the next slide, I, I just have two graphics. They're sort of random graphics, but I just thought that sometimes, you know, a, a visual stimulus is helpful. And, and so the, the graphic on the left is, is a hand-drawn diagram. I forget where I found this years ago, but, uh, you know, the, the, the two sides here, the circles are what you want to say, what people are interested in, 
And in the middle of that is relevance. And that's just always something to keep in mind with your audience is that you might have a lot of content you think the audience wants to hear. And that doesn't really matter unless they're interested in it. Um, and, and that gets a little bit to the deficit model that, that Kari talked about and, and, and the fact that we can't just give people information and expect them to make the right decisions. There's all sorts of individual factors that are, are, are sort of unique to your audience. Uh, and that's what the, the graphic on the right just tries to sort of list a few ideas of things that are um, individual factors that sort of present differently um, at the individual level, but also at the aggregate level within a group or within an intended audience and a group of stakeholders. So things like previous knowledge, existing attitudes, uh, one's image of oneself, the perceived risks of anything you might be communicating about, norms that relate to any of the content, self-efficacy, emotions. And another thing that I know that we're going to talk about a little bit is identity, and that, that plays a part in this as well. Uh, and so really all of these factors are things that you want to be considering about your audience because knowing your audience is really an important first step and making sure that the content that you create and deliver uh, will resonate with them and, and, and ideally have the impact you hope it will have for your organization. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, David, this is a good um, segue into some of your work. Um, the project that I mentioned during the introduction is one that I'm on with um, Dr. Lansing with others um, around the country where we're trying to understand how different audiences view antibiotic stewardship and, you know, the issues related to antimicrobial resistance. And so he's been doing some interesting work, um, more on the social sciences side here lately. So I wanted to see if you could share a little bit about what you've learned recently on communicating with different audiences and kind of when we say general public, that not everybody in the general public is the same, um, same audience. So uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I would I would say I mean uh, obviously uh, not everyone is the same, but I, I would even go so far as to say not uh, each person is a little bit different depending on the context that they're in. And uh, a good way to illustrate this actually is uh, uh, this sort of it's kind of a conundrum in the literature, but it's not really a conundrum. I think if you if you think about it, is this idea known as the uh, the vote buy gap, where people will they will vote to ban a certain agricultural practice, whether it's antibiotic use or something like that. Uh, but then when they go to the store, they will buy those products uh, that that use those same practices, right? Uh, the same people will uh, behave a little bit differently. And uh, in, in the economics literature, this is seen as a big paradox, uh, but it's not really that confusing if you think people uh, take on different types of identities in different situations when you're voting for something, you're a citizen, uh, and, and you're thinking about the issue a little bit differently. Whereas when you're in a grocery store, you're kind of a harried consumer trying to make quick decisions uh, and and the way in which you perceive an issue, it could be the same issue, uh, is going to be quite quite different. So I'd say this uh, conundrum is is a pretty good example of uh, people, people will view a topic differently depending on uh, uh, whether they're uh, a consumer or a citizen or a you know, parent, this sort of thing. I would also say uh, actually to kind of uh, flip what uh, flip around what Andy was saying about know your audience. Uh, the audience is always trying to know the source of, of what they're hearing too. And, you know, there's a lot of research on uh, credibility and whether or not uh, a source is trustworthy, uh, whether a source has enough expertise. Uh, and I, there's some interesting research I've, I've run across uh, kind of teasing out bias too. And there's quite a bit of experimental work showing if a, if a source is perceived as bias and going uh, with their bias that they're seen as less credible with sort of downstream effects about how they might view uh, a topic. However, uh, some evidence out there suggests if a source seems to be going against their perceived bias, that actually gives them more credibility. Uh, I think an example would be um, something like uh, a university administrator giving a message of, uh, you don't necessarily have to go to college, you should maybe go to trade school, uh, student loans aren't worth it, that sort of thing. That would be like a source going against uh, uh, against their perceived bias. So, yeah, I would say people can take on different identities and they're always sort of judging uh, the kind of credibility of, of where they're getting their information from. So that's something to think about when you're crafting your message. All right. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the panelists at, at this point? I'll try to kind of ask as we go so we don't lose momentum if you have a question. So um, I'm going to go back to Dr. Nixon here for just a little bit. And so... You might have been in one of the sessions yesterday when I talked about um, perceptions of benefits and barriers to manure use in agriculture. And I mentioned how um, I have Dr. Nixon come and speak to one of my classes and my husband has her speak to his class. And we always really enjoy having her because she has a very different perspective than we do as, as kind of like hard scientists. And 
she's a good storyteller. And I think that's what usually gets the students listening and, and maybe paying better attention to the topic at hand. So, um, so Dr. Nixon, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your doctoral research, which um, is, is way outside what any of us did for our doctoral or master's research, I'm sure. And it always amazes me that that's a field that someone did doctoral research in. So um, just kind of share some of what you did and what you learned from that, um, from that work. Yeah, so I study the history of how societies have reacted to epidemic disease outbreak. And I was doing it long before anybody cared before 2020. So um, one of my um, archival research pieces that I've done is on the development of inoculation um, to smallpox in the 1720s. Um, and these images on the screen here are just to show you um, basically that people were arguing about this from the moment it came upon the world stage. Um, and to demonstrate both that arguments about vaccination are nothing new, but that arguments about public health are nothing new. Um, so you can see here um, in several arguments proving that the smallpox is not contained in the law of physics, either natural or divine, and therefore unlawful. Uh, together with a reply to two short pieces, one by Dr. Increase Mather and another by an anonymous author. So this is like, I kind of tell people, this is what people were doing before we could fight over Facebook meaninglessly about politics and public health. Um, in the 1700s, you had to publish a pamphlet and you would kind of throw them back and forth at each other. In a second, I'll show you the pamphlet by Increase Mather right here that is it is responding to. And so this one is says several reasons proving that inoculating or transplanting the smallpox is a lawful practice and that it has been blessed by God for the saving of many alive. So um, if you could go back to the previous slide for a second, you'll see that they're even throwing a little bit of shade in the way they're mimicking each other's language and mocking each other. So increased Mather was like several reasons that this is blessed by God and good. And this guy says several arguments proving that it's not divine or blessed by God. Um, and here in the part with the box, it says um, inoculating the smallpox is not a sympathy with nor antipathy unto a wound or disease already received, but a making of a wound, um, which is an abuse of Matthew 912. Um, and then if you could please go forward to the increased Mather one. He was a pastor, so he's also using religious language. Um, God has graciously owned the practice of inoculation among us. Let's see. And the, the hundreds have been inoculated. Um, so therefore, this is blessed by God as a way of healing. Um, and so I show this again to, to demonstrate that public health has always been a tension between the individual body, in this case, the individual person who is being asked to be inoculated and the common good. Um, and it has always been contentious because we're holding ourselves in tension with what is seen as best for the community. Um, go back for a minute. I'm not ready for this slide yet. Sorry. <laughs> um, so inoculation, when it was brought to England, um, was brought by a woman, Mary Wortley Montague, and she had seen it being um, done in Turkey by Greek women. And so when she brought it to England, there was a, a host of fears about this being sort of um, a feminine technology, a foreign technology. There were all of these sort of like suspicions built into that. But also it was a, I mean, you were making a wound in somebody and smearing infectious pus from a smallpox sore into that wound. And so this is an easy example for us to look at, even from our modern sensibilities and say, there's a bit more context to the hesitancies that were displayed there. This was a practice that was kind of visibly grotesque and it had risks. I mean, they didn't have antiseptics at this time. So there was a quite high risk of septicemia and, it, and there were these cultural factors, this in-group, out-group thinking of like, should we trust these medical technologies from over there? Now, if you could please go to the next slide. Thank you. Once Jenner, um, about 70 years later, developed a, a bit safer method of using cowpox, which is less virulent to humans, he sort of rebranded it as English and domestic. 
And so there was a, a bit less superstition about it. But as you can see from this political cartoon, which depicts all these people growing cow part out of their bodies, there was still this sort of context-based fear of putting animal body parts into a human. And so, again, these stories just show that these tensions and worries have always been there, but that if we don't consider the actual things, and this kind of goes back to what Andy is saying, like, what are people actually concerned about? What are they actually relating, reacting to. If we're not actually addressing that, if we just keep saying, well, the data shows that vaccines are effective, but we're not saying, okay, well, people have this sort of seemingly natural fear of injecting themselves with animal parts at this point in history, then we're not actually, we're talking at cross purposes and we're never going to get anywhere. We're just kind of spinning our wheels. Um, And the final example I have for you jets forward um, to the 1830s, when Ignaz Semmelweis was working in one of the early obstetrical wards, um, right at the dawn of obstetrics, as physicians were trying to market themselves as obstetricians, which means they had to kind of say like midwives are more dangerous, you should use a doctor. What was ironically happening and hurting their marketing efforts is that women were dying rampantly under the care of obstetricians much more quickly than they've been dying under midwives. So Ignaz Semmelweis, he gets um, a residency as the obstetrical ward overseer. And this hospital had an obstetrics ward and a midwife ward. And he was able to basically track statistically, okay, people are dying at way greater rates over here when obstetricians are involved and never when midwives are involved. He theorized the only difference he could see between doctors and midwives were that midwives only did birth. Doctors did a whole host of other things. And even though they, there wasn't extant a concept in society about germ theory at this point, he felt that there was some kind of contamination happening through, he thought maybe autopsies of women who had died in childbirth. So you can see here, he suggests that, um, the doctors wash their hands between patients. And this was a brand new concept at the time. And I show the story to say, to kind of It's helpful to defamiliarize things that are so obvious to us, particularly that are obvious to us as data-driven, science-minded people, because it might surprise you to learn that he was fired for this suggestion. Um, And he ended up dying destitute and in an insane asylum. Like he was far from receiving accolades for this discovery that we now know to be one of the most paramount changes in modern sanitation that's ever existed. This story, I think, just shows how resistant people will be, even science and quantitative research minded people, doctors in this case, to new data that tells them what to do with their bodies and which is backed up by new and emerging scientific methodologies. Um, In this case, they didn't really have the framework of germ theory to explain his reasoning um, at this point. So I, I use these to show that like people always tend to react these ways, but that there are contextual factors that are limiting people's willingness to hear the message, as Andy um, alluded to. Um, For instance, Ignaz Semmelweis was frankly kind of a jerk. He called all the doctors around him murderers. Um, I don't think that primed them. However accurate he may have been, it did not prime them to hear the data. And so this, these are just two really good stories that I think demonstrate that it's about so many factors. And David mentioned this too. Even if in some contexts we might be, you know, we're physicians, we're primed to listen to data. In this context, you insulted me and now I'm mad, right? And now I don't want to listen because now we've gotten into some kind of like water cooler business place office war, right? Um, which is what Semmelweis's story kind of demonstrates. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I always, I think students always enjoy that, like seeing what crazy things they thought years ago that now we think is just totally normal. Um, so maybe in a hundred years, people will wear masks every day and not think anything of it. And they won't argue about um, <laughs> that you shouldn't tell me to wear a mask in public when people are sick. So, okay. So I want to go back to Dr. King. Um, one of the things I've heard him talk about before is challenges with making sure that your message is heard. And so Dr. Nixon um, kind of jokingly talked about the pre-Facebook era of writing a pamphlet that got handed out and then writing a response to that that got handed out. 
But now we're in this age of rapid fire social media and you're competing with so many different sources of information to get your message heard. So, so Dr. King, maybe you can talk a little bit about how we communicate so that we have the very best chance of having our message heard um, by the audience we're, we're working with. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of important considerations here, right? We, we want to think about exposure because we have to make sure that our audience actually sees the messages that we put together. Uh, that's, that's the first big barrier. Um, but then also to sort of cut through the noise and, and, and have your audience attend to that message and actually process the message and think through the message. And so um, a lot of the work that I do is, is focused on the public communication environment uh, and, and, and on information and misinformation and communication inequalities uh, sort of in the, in the public space on social media platforms and uh, sort of in more traditional you know, news media and, and things of that nature. But um, so I just want to talk about a, a handful of things here about sort of exposure and about and cutting through the noise. And so the, the first thing I just want to mention is that nothing that always works always works. And so I, I'm, I'm always very wary when anyone says that something, you know, like we find that it always works that we do this. I suppose in some private industries, in some very specific messaging to particular populations, that might be true. But generally, my experience across populations um, and looking at segmented audiences, nothing that always works, always works. Um, I know we're going to talk more about narratives today. And narratives are a great example of this. Narratives don't always work. Um, Stories don't always work. They work a lot. They can be really impactful when they do work. But a meta-analysis and sort of, a you know, which is, if you're not familiar, is a study of studies um, shows that print narratives tend not to work, or at least very inconsistently work, whereas video narratives work reasonably well. And even if they do work, what's important to remember is that any message that you send out, any information you send out is one little piece in this giant constellation of messages that are sent out every minute of every day. And in the current public information environment, we're talking about you know, I, I've heard government agencies refer to it as, as the wild west of information, uh, which I think is a bit of a strange term, but I suppose it works if you want to use a metaphor. But it's 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 hard to control what information is out there. User generated content makes up more of the content base that exists presently than at any other point in human history. Uh, and user generated content is great because it gives sort of opportunities for people who have been underrepresented or otherwise marginalized to have a voice. But it also lets every person who wants to say anything have a platform to say those things. And so there's a lot that goes on with that, that that's hard. And so I, that really brings me to the second point here where accuracy is important. And I know that that's always a focus for scientists and, and, and we should never sacrifice uh, accuracy, but it can't be everything. It's not everything. And, and that sort of goes to that deficit model that we're talking about. And in the case of misinformation, whether it be about COVID-19 or any number of things that inaccurate information has existed, as Kari Serpa said, historically, right? Hundreds of years, misinformation and inaccurate information has been problematic, particularly as new scientific information is, has regularly been introduced, you know, every year, every day, is that accuracy is just not enough. You have to do more than that. And so that includes this next point of avoid technical terms when possible, unless you're really sure that your audience knows the technical term, because technical terms will put people off. Jargon generally puts people off of your message, and and they're going to have a hard time remembering a word that they have to learn in addition to whatever context you want the word to go in uh, right after you've introduced it. But also just keep in mind these sort of the potential aspects that, that of life that people have to deal with when they're processing your message. And so in, on the healthcare side of communication, right, one of the concerns is that, well, we want to make sure that people in lower income areas uh, who traditionally don't get screened for cancer get screened for cancer. And the reality is they're not really going to pay attention to your screen for cancer message when they can't pay their heat or gas bill. Um, like that's just not something that's going to work. And so you're not going to cut through that noise uh, in, in particular audience segments. And, and again, I use that as an example. There's there's dozens of examples that I imagine if we sat down or if we were all in person, we could come up with where whatever your message is, someone might see it. They might even sort of pay attention to it, but it doesn't matter because of the other barriers in their life uh, to, to sort of engaging in different behaviors, right? So people might want to buy a particular product that um, has some sort of agricultural attribute to it, but they're not able to do so uh, because it's either not available where they live or it's just not priced in, in, in sort of a, a way that they could afford. Um, and so you want to think about those, those sort of other factors to make sure that your message is actually resonating, that you're providing people with a message that they can do something about, that they can act on in some way. Uh, And a good way to do that, obviously, this last sort of uh, part is to get outside of whatever bubble it is that you're creating the message in and get feedback uh, on your content before distributing it. We can't always get feedback from the audiences that we want, uh, but even a little bit of feedback is better than no feedback at all. And 
that includes expert feedback, but ideally it would be from the audience or people who, who sort of represent the audience reasonably well. And I'll just make one caveat to that. That doesn't mean a consumer advocacy group because they have their own views and their own perceptions of this. It would be actual consumers to get the information from uh, and not people who might be otherwise heavily invested in a community uh, or, or sort of are the most prominent members of those audience um, in terms of sort of visibility because they're willing and have the time to give you feedback. And that might not be the people who actually um, need to be giving feedback on messages that could be complicated or delivered again at a time uh, when people aren't necessarily ready to hear it. All right. So a lot of um, a lot of advice there on your audience. I'm curious, does anybody ever um, run an extension uh, guide sheet by farmers before you publish it? I never have. Have you? So. Yeah, we've been thinking that farms wanted to make it on a cell phone. And that was going to be in my own country, but I wanted to post a cell phone or internet. So it was a hard, it was a challenge. We were like showing the guys with them, and they were like, I don't want to be Collect something, have choices. So at the end, we did to have two versions of the guide. One was online, and the other one was on paper because it was easier for them to use it, and they were way more used to use it like that. Um, but the hundred percent of the information we had, we changed it like half of it because we weren't like very answering or asking the right questions. So that's a, I mean, that's a good example of being aware of the barriers. So you could, you could have a really awesome website that steps you through the process of anaerobic digestion. But if a farmer doesn't, doesn't use a computer, they're not going to see that particular tool. So I think a lot of times we create content with one specific route of delivery in mind, and maybe don't consider that like, we should have this, get this out in different ways for different audiences. And I'm, as guilty of that as anybody. So I think that's that's really good to getting feedback on your content. Just quick to, to jump on, just something about that, that's relevant to this is that I, I do know that there's some work in, in different agricultural sector, sectors to animal and, and, and uh, sort of, you know, or plant-based is that um, to focus on sort of apps and app development. And, and the one thing that I think is really interesting and uh, my wife happens to work in technology development and works on apps and that sort of thing is um, <laughs> what, what seems to not be always sort of top of mind is the inconsistency of internet connections. Uh, and so the, the, the app is just in case anyone in the audience is developing apps, like make sure you have an offline mode that it can be used offline, that you don't lose a lot of the features. And so that's like, just again, another small thing, but people can, you can develop the, the best product. And if it's not set up for success, obviously that's going to be really problematic. And so those offline features, when we're dealing with such um, sort of diverse technological contexts, where people might not have access to, to um, a consistent internet connection or a fast internet connection um, is, is really an important feature of these sort of communication technologies moving forward, which gets kind of off topic, but it's something else that I'm interested in. And so I'm just going to throw a plug in. No, that's good. And that kind of reminded me one of the things we recently did in Nebraska. So we have a nutrient management record keeping calendar. And I know other states have, have we adopted it from, could have been Ohio or Indiana, and we've used it for several years and then other states have seen it and they've, they created their own versions of it. And it's always been like an, an eight and a half by 11, you know, size when it's folded, kind of small text, hard to read. And it, what it's designed for is like every day when you look at it, it says, you know, did it rain today? Like record the rainfall. Cause this is something you have to report in your annual report at the end of the year. And it'll say like, have you walked the lagoon berm lately to look um, for erosion or, you know, other maintenance issues. So it kind of reminds you to do all those things. And so about a year ago, we thought we sh we've never updated this. We really should update the look of it. The, you know, so we made it bigger, which we thought was great because then it gives people more room to write things. We made it a little, you know, more colorful and all these things. And so we started handing them out and Leslie Johnson um, I saw her at a meeting and she's like, I kind of don't want to tell you this, but one farmer is really mad that we made that calendar different. And I was like, well, like, what's wrong with it? You know? And she said, well, he always three hole punches it and puts it in his binder as his record keeping for the year. And now with this bigger version, he can't do that. And I was like, well, we worked too hard to go back to the eight and a half by 11 version. But one person was like, mm, nope, I don't like it. I mean, I'm sure he's still using it because it still gets him all that data he needs, but but yeah, we, we never really thought about like, how do they use it after they're done with the year? They stick it in a binder and they file it away. So I don't think we'll go back to the old one, but it's, it's good to know, like we should think of those things in the future. One of the things that, that I really 
hate about um, Andy's message right there is that nothing that always works, always works. And we are scientists and we are like, when we find something that works, what do we do? We write a protocol and we do it the same way the next time because it worked, right? So that's like a hard concept for science-minded people. You know, we want to find something that works and then use it. So that, I think that's a real challenge. But uh, Dr. Lansing, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about the social aspect of people and why something that works today with that group may not work tomorrow with that group. Talk a little bit about how different people receive expert advice or uh, quote expert advice and how understanding the way they receive messages can help us deliver messages better. Okay, sure. Uh, I thought I would summarize. This is just one paper. It's not my paper. It's a paper by uh, Dan Cahan, but I, I think it does a pretty good job of, of getting at how different types of people process, uh, they evaluate the legitimacy of scientific information uh, in different ways. And it was, if you look at that statement on the top, human activity is the cause of global warming. This is a statement with uh, strong scientific consensus. The National Academies has, have put out a report. This is their conclusion. All of the relevant eminent scientists in the country have, have strongly endorsed this claim. But in, in an experiment of uh, people who were tested on uh, what he calls their, their cultural worldviews, whether they're uh, along a uh, axis of hierarchy uh, or egalitarian or uh, individualist or communitarian. So uh, a hierarchical focused person would be someone who's more or less okay with certain uh, the current social orderings along class, race, gender, and uh, individualist means you think individuals are responsible for their uh, outcome in life. It uh, doesn't map exactly, but you could code these people as, as conservative. Similarly, an egalitarian would be someone who would agree with a statement that says we should do more to end social inequality, and communitarians are uh, people uh, who, well, anyway, these people could be coded as politically liberal for the most part. That's an easier way to think about it. And what he found is people who were on the, the higher ends of these uh, cultural worldviews, the hierarchical individualists or conservatives, if you want to think about it, uh, tended to assess that statement on top as uh, there being uh, not any scientific consensus on that. And uh, whereas the egalitarian communica uh, communitarian said there was clear scientific uh, agreement on that statement. Similarly, the statement on the bottom, uh, permitting adults without a criminal background or history of mental illness to have concealed handguns in public reduces violent crime. There's actually no scientific consensus on this. The National Academies uh, put out a report and they said there's no evidence either way. They said they didn't agree or disagree with it. And probably unsurprisingly, the hierarchical individualist said uh, that uh, there was strong scientific consensus that this statement is true, whereas the egalitarian communitarian said they're strong, uh, that, that, that this is untrue, according to the science, and they, they wouldn't believe it. So the study is, the, the overall gist of the study is, uh, whatever kind of science, scientific information you give to folks, they're going to process it through some sort of pre-existing cultural uh, worldview. And oftentimes it, it can, this was specifically looking at like risk factors. And his thesis was that folks who uh, will often look at the sort of uh, conclusions, uh, they'll, they'll take a step further what these statements mean. And if, you know, humans are the cause of global warming, then this often implies regulation of industry, government intervention in the economy. And this is something hierarchical individualists don't really care for and egalitarian communica uh, communitarians are, are fine with. So I, I bring up the study because I think Kari had mentioned this, this idea of like the deficit model, like you can't really just filling people with science or information doesn't necessarily work. And I, I like the study because I, I think it kind of gets at why that is, is because people tend to process information through whatever kind of cultural or political worldview that they might actually have. And so you can you can see this today with debates around masking. I know, especially early on in the pandemic, it felt like my Facebook feed was filled with dueling, uh, dueling studies on masking. <laughs> uh, more of my conservative friends were uh, just positive the science says masking doesn't work. Where, well, more of my liberal friends were posting studies that said the opposite. And you often see this in scientific controversies where actually you see dueling science or different studies being marshaled, but actually what's really underneath that are people have actually different values about uh, how the world is and how the world should be. And so what often can appear um, when it comes to controversial issues or issues around risk, what, what can sometimes seem as debates about the science, whether debates about the science of global warming or masking, uh, they're not really debates about the science. They're actually science is being marshaled in, in the service of certain values uh, that people have. So uh, I don't really have much more of a meta point than that, other than uh, is this, I think this provides a, a, 
pretty good framework for thinking about. You can give information to people. I think that feeds in with what Andy was saying about what always works doesn't always work. Uh, it depends on uh, how somebody might process that kind of information that you give. All right. Any questions or comments? Are there situations where you've done programming for, I, I mean, one of the things we've done and we take a lot of our content that's in English and we have it translated into Spanish and we think that's going to work, but we don't translate the cultural you know, the underlying cultural issues with that, that content. And so we just changing the language isn't enough. It's got to, you've got to understand how to deliver it differently to that group. So I don't know if that's something that you've, you've run into or had specific examples of that um, you would want to share, but. I, I found that last discussion by Dr. Lansing, very depressing. I mean, it's probably true. It almost makes you, as a scientist, want to say, why bother if people don't listen to the science? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's a good response to that from our panelists, but but I, I, I don't disagree there. You kind of are like, I, I was in a meeting recently about um, nitrate nitrogen management, and I thought, so they've been kind of updating our nitrogen recommendations in Nebraska over you know, it's continuous. They're always doing research on that. But the colleague I was with was delivering that information to a group of farmers and they were not having it from him. I mean, they were like personally against him because he was delivering it. And I felt bad for him because he's been there like two years. And I finally stood up and I'm like, okay, he did not come up with these new rules. He is delivering them to you. And the research came from a lot of people Science changes, it evolves. That's why we keep doing it. We keep learning new things and then we share it with you. So like if I understand if you don't like that, this is going to change how you do practices, but we didn't just come up with this out of thin air. And this poor guy is not the one that came into the university and decided let's change this for everybody in the state. So, so it is hard like to deliver something you think is really good information and have people go like, yeah, I don't really believe you. I don't, I don't really, I don't buy it. I'm not going to do that, which I think is why <laughs> these folks are helpful to us. You know, Dr. Nixon, when she saw a lot of our content um, about antimicrobial resistance, you know, we were very technical oriented and she's like, well, maybe if you tell it like this, I know when she speaks to my husband's class, um, it's a, he's a meat scientist at UNL and he has a bunch of ag kids in there who think, you know, they don't like meatless Monday. They don't like PETA. They don't like um, the, the claim that they're responsible for food safety. And I know the last time you spoke to them, they, they were kind of dumbfounded at one point, he said, because you were like, you know, I don't really care about all those issues that you think about. Here's what, here's what you need to know about the audience you're talking to. Um, so sometimes I think it's good for people like you to turn us upside down and say like, yeah, nobody cares what your underlying reasons are for sharing this information. Let's talk about it in a way that the audience cares. Did you want to comment on that, Kari? Yeah, I, I remember that moment. It was really kind of cool because I was like, well, tell me like why you actually care. And then, you know, Ty was able to come in and they were like, well, it's a lean, sustainable, like it's a, they were trying to do all this sciencey stuff about why beef is healthy. And Ty, knowing them better, was able to be like, that's crap. Like, why do you actually care? And they started talking about like their family line and how this has been handed down generations and they actually like really like cows as animals and friends and you know then it was I was able to say like these are the things that are going to communicate to people outside of your silo but um and I mean there's some logical flaws to what I'm about to say here but I get that it can be depressing because you feel like, well, nobody's going to care about, you know, these things that I spent all this time on. But I guess like the hard headedness in me is like, but we can, if we get it designed well, if we get the communications pitched right, we can get them to care. We're just going about it the wrong way. Now, what Andy says is unfortunately right. Like, I am a little bit naive about that too. Like, nothing always works. And, um, you know, my book on COVID communications, like a lot of my own people in my political party did not like the book because I was saying we should like branch out and like try to understand the other perspectives. And people were just like, absolutely not. You're the worst. And yeah, that's demoralizing because like I'm an expert in how we get through to people and how we should get out of a pandemic. Um, but I think, Amy, you said it in a really succinct way is just a, a kind of concise way of thinking about it is that the reason that we care about something as scholars who are in this little field is just generally probably 
atypical statistically, like not that many people wanted to study one thing for this long. And so we can't assume that our reasons for caring and our motivations will be others. Again, that's an error that I think I've made in my own public health communications work is like assuming that my my belief that we need to get out of these silos, that people will listen to that, like it's failed as well. But I continue to be kind of hard headed and think that if we keep trying, we can get the messaging properly directed so people care. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I joke about the I am responsible project. We're like, you know, informing people. We want them to understand antimicrobial resistance and then we want them to adapt their behavior so that in the end we're we're saving um, antibiotics. And I'm like, if if I just get half the population to understand it before I die, I'll probably be doing a good job because it's just not a, it's not an interesting topic until you deliver it in a way that they think, oh yeah, like I, I do know somebody that had a resistant infection that died from it, or I do know somebody that farms and I know they take good care of their animals uh, to reduce their, you know, antibiotic use. Did you have a question back here? I'm going to bring the mic back there. Okay. Um, this is just kind of a general question for any of the panel um, going along with j- this gentleman's comment, how do you, or how do we work around buzzwords, if you will, um, like he talked about trying to get people to uh, trust the science. I feel like that has become a buzzword, like particularly with COVID, like just trust the science, trust the science. And we hear it so much. Some people believe it. Some people don't believe it, but how do we work around those buzzwords like regenerative and sustainable and climate smart that our producers hear so often that they immediately tune out? I mean, I'll, I'll chime in because just about the previous comment and about this question. So I think that to your point, it sounds like you already have an idea, which is, is don't use them with, with the, that particular audience, right? Like focus on different language. Um, and this is how we've gone from global warming to climate change to extreme weather events like that, that like, because that, continues to not work. And even though people know the difference, there's a period of time where the message lands differently. And so use different words um, if it makes sense or figure out ways. And this is the challenge. There's not like, I don't have like a a, a sort of a a magic needle type of of response to give here, but find other ways to incorporate that that language in a way that resonates with your audience, right? So if it doesn't resonate when it's used in, you know, combination with a few different terms and a few different topics, then don't use it with those topics, use it with these other topics. Um, I think sustainability is a great example of that. I don't think that most people who are engaged in agriculture have anything against sustainability, but I understand the the buzzword um, sort of negative response to this idea of sustainability, uh, not the actual sustainability as a set of processes, for example, that might exist and might benefit the operation. And so I think related to both of these questions, uh, a relevant thing to mention is that Part of it's a part about all of this as communicators is, is about expectations. And so like part of that frustration, I think, is that there's an expectation that you're going to be able to reach your audience. And, and, and something to keep in mind is that like, you might not be able to. That's part of this, too. Like, it's not just that not that things that don't always work don't always work. Like, I'll go ahead and be a, a bigger pessimist here and say sometimes you will just ultimately continue to to fail to reach your audience. And 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 you should keep trying. Um, and so I, I think that the expectation, one of my favorite sort of communication researchers is also a friend of mine, his name is Dan O'Keefe. He always talks about communication effects and how they're small and how some people really see them, meaning that sort of communication instances often have a small impact at a single point in time. Obviously, they have a larger impact over a longer period of time, but they also have an uncertain impact at, at that single or multiple exposure period of time. And that the only reason to be upset about that, the only reason to be depressed about that is if you really thought any time that you, you went to speak, that you were going to influence everyone in that room. I know today, I don't know how many people are in that room. There could be a hundred, there could be a thousand, there could be 10. And I would say, I'd be lucky if anything that I said stuck with 20% of the people there. That would be an amazing accomplishment. Uh, if, if 20% of anything that any of us said stuck with 20% of the audience. And, and you might say like, well, that's really depressing. I would say that that's a win. Um, if, if any of you have, have taught in, in a classroom, or have taught in a sort of like a lunch and learn type of setting or anything like that, you know, some of those students and some of those people there aren't paying attention or getting these things. And that it doesn't surprise you. You're trying to speak to the ones that want to learn something. And so in the case of of a lot of science communication, I think really the thing to keep in mind is that you want to make sure that your efforts aren't worthless, but that the worth is, is sort of not predetermined as being all successful or all um, sort of a failure. And so if your expectation is that we're going to make an impact, 
but it's an uncertain impact and it may be a smaller impact than we hope to make. That's okay. Like that's like what should motivate you is that that you're you're incrementally creating this change. Like there, there's communication by itself has never sort of magically changed anything or improved anything for anyone. Um, it has over time improved it for lots of people. Um, and, and so I think that it's not, um, this is a, I, I don't really like to use metaphors, but you know, you can lose a few battles and still win a war. And, and that's does apply in this situation. If we think about these different communication things, I don't like to be combative. I don't think the communication should be combative. So that's not a great metaphor, but um, you know, you can lose a few innings in a game if we're using a sports metaphor and still win the game. I don't know. I, I never know what, what metaphor to use here, but the point is you can fail sometimes and still succeed overall. And that's a possibility. And I get that it sucks. And I get that I'm not up here and that none of us up here are telling you like, here's what you do to fix all your communication woes, but that's okay. Like that's part of this, I think. And I agree with Kari. One of the, one of the things here is that like, I get excited about talking about this stuff because it's a puzzle that I've decided that I'm going to spend my life trying to figure out. And I haven't even figured out that much about it yet. Uh, and that's the part. And to be clear, like I've been reasonably successful as an academic and as someone who sort of has, has sort of worked with applied partners and things like that. And I still don't feel like I have a ton of it figured out. But I've, I've had successes and I've had failures, and just have to keep building on those and try to keep making those better and contribute to sort of overall efforts that will improve the situation for science communicators moving forward. If that makes sense, I, I don't mean to, to randomly go off on that tangent, but I think that sort of addresses both questions a little bit, which is there's no clear answer to that, but. When it comes to specific language, you can make decisions to include it or exclude it and think about clever ways to make that novel, um, or you get rid of it and you just start coming up with new terminology that makes sense for you. So um, that, that's my two cents to those two questions. All right, thanks. It kind of reminds me of, um, and I never know if this is an appropriate story to tell, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. The antimicrobial resistance group, the IAMR group, the first year that we were kind of formed, we decided we should do something for national, uh, Antibiotic, World Antibiotic Awareness Week, which is in November. We should, you know, we should do something. And we're all on college campuses. So we should go, you know, set up in the union, hand out information about antimicrobial resistance, you know, maybe hand out alcohol-based wet wipes, things like that. And as we're, as we're putting this information together, I'm like, I don't know that anybody, what, why is a college student going to care about antimicrobial resistance? And we were talking to some of the Department of Health people um, that we'd met along the way. And she was telling us how college campuses or co towns with colleges in them are hot spots for antibiotic resistant gonorrhea and multiple drug resistances. So it's not just like one or two things that don't work anymore, There's several drugs. And I'm like, well, that might catch their attention. And so we're thinking, you know, like super bugs, whatever. So we made a, a flyer that said, there's nothing super about gonorrhea which I never thought in my life of my career I would talk about. But um, I don't know that we made an impact on very many, but there was one girl, I don't know if you remember her, Mara, who stopped and she was like, what, what, what does this mean? And we said, well, gonorrhea is a bacterial infection. And normally, you know, you just take an antibiotic, but it, it's getting to where antibiotics no longer work. And they have to kind of look for different, more stronger antibiotic. And she's like, that's a thing. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's, gonorrhea is a thing and if resistance is a thing. And, and she was just like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, and she just kind of walked away. Like I thought, well, one person, she, she's probably going to go and tell her friends like, guys, <laughs> you need to know this. But um, that was like the one person we felt like we reached that day. And, you know, we go into this studying antimicrobial resistance in the environment. And then we're talking to kids about gonorrhea. So you just never know where your career is going to take you, right? Um, but Amy, I'd say you should give yourself even more credit because realistically, you also exposed a bunch of people to those terms that maybe they had never really heard before. Yeah. And so that's a step two. So it, it, it's, it's a secondary outcome maybe because maybe what you wanted was a bunch of interactions like that. But that doesn't mean that there weren't other effects of that communication that you weren't looking for that it also contributed to overall. I find that when I talk about this topic with younger crowds, like I talked at the Block and Bridal National Convention a few weeks ago and I brought this up to them and everybody in the room, I'm like, you all are paying attention now. You weren't a minute ago, but now you are. So <laughs> sometimes that just brings everybody back, back to focus and then you can get a message across. David, did you have a, a comment? Well, I just, you know, to Andy's point, I could easily envision a student who maybe th their first two years, they don't notice this campaign, but by year three, they're like, there's that gonorrhea poster again. What is that all about? Right. It's like getting that, get doing it over and over 
you know, reaching that 20%, if you keep doing it over and over, sometimes I, I think that's what that takes too. Yeah, we, uh, we didn't give out all our stuff about that, I know, but there's not really other settings that we give, <laughs> give that kind of information out at our extension events. Um, Todd, you have a question? So if anybody needs pamphlets on that data. I'm going to add on to what Dave has talked about. I think we have such a society that expects it to be microwave is going to be quick. But if anybody's been in sales, they say it takes sometimes six or seven times before you finally get that sale for that new person. And we have this expectation that people are going to get it right away, but it may take a series of things happening for them to finally be brought over. So we just have to keep the faith that just keep telling the truth, keep being transparent, and eventually it'll happen. Yeah, that's our that's our long term impact we're all looking for, right? An extension that we can report on. Um, so I want to go back, um, kind of onto the the script because the next thing we were going to talk about was different methods of communicating. And um, Dr. Nixon, I think I was going to have you speak on this. And she and I and um, Mara, there's a couple other people that aren't at this meeting. We recently, we've got a manuscript we've written about these communications and about like a model for communicating scientific information in our extension and outreach um, that we've been in review for some time. Um, <laughs> we don't know if we're ever going to hear from the publisher, but these are concepts that I didn't really know about prior to working through this information with Dr. Nixon. I might have skipped ahead. Do you want to cover, go ahead into that next one. This you sent to me and I wasn't sure what all you wanted to tell folks about it, but yeah, this is just a little bit more evidence about going into what we have found uh, to give you some concrete tips about what seems to be effective coming out of both. Well, I tried to make it as interdisciplinary as I could so that I could convince all of the stakeholders in this room, because this is a good like sort of meta analysis example of my own strategy. In my assumption, I'm coming in here to a room of scientists and engineers, and I'm trying to tell you that you should tell stories. And I assume that there's going to be an initial resistance to that, because even I, as a sort of data-oriented humanities scholar, would be like, oh, it's not all like fun and games, Nixon. You got you to gotta sink your teeth into the data. So I tried to pull evidence from as many uh, fields as I could that demonstrate why and how we know that the data deficit model is insufficient and to give you some concrete uh, reasons why narrative seems to be more functional. Um, and then I'm going to move into some specific tips that we have found on our team um, and in our research, like what, what seems to help a bit. So you at least walk away with um, some ideas, some concrete things. So we know from um, my field, narrative theory, that, and I know, like, I don't know about you, but, like, when I hear narrative theory, I want to, like, fall asleep, but don't. Like, it's it's just a quick, like, little tidbit um, that we have no way as humans, basically, to separate an event that has occurred from a story. And by that, I mean story, like, the way we tell it. There is no way to tell somebody, I fell down without shaping that some way with language. And so to the point that it becomes a story. So if you say, um, you know, if your five-year-old daughter comes running up to you crying and says, I fell down, that's different than me um, telling Amy like, oh my God, I fell on my face in the quad in front of Dr. King and it was really embarrassing. Um, even if we kept it to the basic sentence structure of I fell down, those contextual factors of who's telling the story and who they're telling it to, as Andy and David have already alluded to, shape the meaning of that story from a sad childhood event to a kind of comical, embarrassing colleague story. So Given that, um, we know that from the humanities, we have everyone from like even going into neurological sciences um, and evolutionary psychology, anthropology that postulate that they don't think the human brain as it evolved into the homo sapien model existed ever at a time without the capacity for and need for grounding in narrative. Um, Oliver Sacks has famously kind of shown some case studies where he feels like a basic part of a human's ability to communicate was um, changed when um, they lost a certain part of their brain functionality. Kay Young and Jeffrey Shaver in uh, an article titled The Neurology of Narrative 
also argue that it's a fundamental part of the human brain. Anthropologists have speculated from a variety of ways that when we develop the capacity to narrate, um, and they go back to like mythology, basically, that that's kind of aligned with when we evolved into our current species. Um, we also have evidence from uh, psychology. There are theorists that um, talk about like the very violent Grimm's fairy tales narratives, or if you think about like Disney, um, that the parents are always dead in Disney. They talk about the, uh, the need for children to have this imaginative independence to speculate um, about cause and effect. So we have so many fields that say that narrative is really what we're built for as humans. And that essentially we've just kind of grown and progressed to have data added onto it so that we almost always need to sort of reverse engineer the data back into a narrative. Um, I mean, and if you even think about scientific literature itself, we always have a results and discussion session, section where we sort of interpret that and shape it for even um, like-minded literate readers. And then just a point against the data deficit model, this is something uh, David uh, referred to a very related study. Um, this study that I have up here basically demonstrated that not only will people cognate, uh, think through cognitively the information that you're giving them through their already existing social groups, so they're going to revert, that's the cultural cognition theory that um, David had up on the screen, that uh, particularly when we're faced with scary information, like the world might be ending, because we are social creatures that evolved to live in groups together so that the tigers didn't kill us, we're going to go back to that safety net of, uh, of the people we already trust. And if that's people that are climate science deniers, that's where we're going to go to process that destabilizing scary information. What Brahman et al. in 2012 found is that, in fact, the more scientifically literate we are, the more we're going to fight against controversial new scientific data. Um, they don't add this in their theory. I extrapolate that that is, frankly, because greater scientific literacy allows us to enter that debate more effectively and say, well, what about your sample size? Or should you have run an ANOVA? Or should you have run this other test? Um, and so again, when we're saying like, beat them over the head with the data, we're actually missing the point that um, in fact, the greater they understand the data, the more they're able to fight against us with their pre-existing opinion. Amy, if you would go, or whoever's doing the slides, go for us. Yeah, these are kind of some of the reasons we value anecdotal data over um, evidence. We are built to be social. That social um, evolution primed us for communication and narrative. And we're also built to see things at a, our scale. Um, we weren't built when we first evolved. We didn't come with a microscope in our hand. We were built to see things that are at the visible scale. We can't therefore effectively scale super, super high into the millions. And we can't scale very well imaginatively to the microscopic. There's a lot of great studies from Slovich, S-L-O-V-I-C, who said, he has a famous study, the more who die, the less we care. You're going to be more effective. Here's my first concrete tip about scale. You're going to be more effective if you talk about one person dying of antibiotic resistance, then saying every year 800,000 people die of antibiotic resistance, humans are not evolved to really be able to process that. And we have quantitative data that demonstrates that's true through Slovich. We're also really the one, like one of the most concrete things I've seen about data, which I'm always arguing is messy and fluid and changes. One of the most consistent findings we have though about human understanding of science is that we're terrible. Like we're garbage at understanding risk. Um, and we're more garbage at risk assessment when the stakes are high and we're emotional. We hear risk analysis cognitively, but we react to risk emotionally. So there's this disconnect there as well. So you take a risk that's not at scale, let's say COVID, an invisible, scalarly invisible virus, killing a scale of people that we can't imagine, 
And then you add to it that we can't assess risk, like really at all, like we're risk blind, <laughs> we're not good at it. And, and you've got to do a few things to make people care. So if you would go to the, I think the next slide. Yep. These are the things we found in our study. Um, it was sort of, we just sort of a qualitative lit review meta-analysis. Put something at the human scale. In our work, we tried to talk about the way um, the lateral evolution of bacteria, we tried to talk about it in terms of like beekeeping and superorganisms like hives, beehives, because we can think about how those function as more than their individual parts. Um, I know Andy says he doesn't like metaphors, but we uh, studies have shown that metaphor can help through these highly polarized debates to put things in a way that people can understand using narrative. Um, to the same point, there's been studies that show that non-agentive language is also helpful. This is from Fauci and Boroditsky in 2010. Agentive language highlights somebody to blame. And we theorized in our paper that when somebody feels like they're getting blamed, they're going to retreat to that cultural cognition where they're processing it through in-group, out-group thinking. You've basically assigned them blame as the person who's responsible for the world ending. And they're going to, you're automatically the out-group and they're going to retreat to what they already think. And related to that are trusted narrator. So if you could find somebody from their group that they already trust to tell them these things, this goes back to what David, I believe, said about you have an educational administrator that's saying you shouldn't go to college. That's, you want somebody from their group that might surprise them by being a stakeholder in this information. And all of that works to de-escalate, de take it out of the political realms, decatastrophize things. Even if I feel like it's a catastrophe, I'm not going to get through to you if I'm telling you it's a catastrophe and you're to blame if you don't listen to me. That's that's kind of, and there's a lot of things I think we do that implicitly do that. It's not like we're actively saying those words. Um, in our IMR work, one of our slogans is we are all responsible. That tries to say like, we all can do a little something. We're not trying to make you feel bad. Um, guilt trip you for not recycling or whatever. I can vividly remember as a seven-year-old, the recycling PSAs, like it made me want to not recycle because I felt like they were like putting all this blame on me as like a little kid um, for, you know, having plastics in my life. So um, Dr. Lansing or Dr. King, do you want to comment on any of those approaches or other ones that you think are valuable? I'll comment on metaphor just to clarify my perspective. So the, the challenge with metaphor is a little bit like the challenge with narrative, which is in a vacuum, if we're saying, can they work? The answer is yes. But what metaphor, what story, those things matter. And so my, 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 my comment there would be to say that like, there are certainly data that support and there's evidence to support using certain metaphors and certain stories in certain situations. Trusted narrators, probably one, the one that's most consistent, I think, out of this, of the, the of what's up here on the slide, like of being something that's a good, that will lead to good outcomes, uh, sort of strategically advantageous outcomes. Um, but that, you know, there's, for metaphor, there are metaphors that, and studies that have shown, for example, using metaphors um, during informed consent processes for people ends up confusing people about what actually the risks are. And so, you know, that, but there, that said, there may be a metaphor that works. And so that's going to be one of the frustrations, I imagine, um, just for, for, for those in the audience who maybe are feeling already frustrated, which is to say, like, metaphors work, probably, but you got to find the right one. Uh, and you might not know what that is in the first place. So you're going to have to try a few. Um, but that's, that's unfortunately the sort of, I think, the responsible advice to share is to say that, like, yes, they work when they work which is of course tautological. So we have to figure out what are the features of them that might be most efficient, most frequently. Uh, so that, I think that's the one thing I would mention really about all of these. Um, and that's true for really any communication approach is that like, it, it's a starting place for you. The evidence is a starting place. And then you really have to think about your audience and, and how you can adapt it for your strategic purposes. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the um, demonstration, like for kids, I was doing a water event years ago in Mississippi. And we were trying to talk about how much the earth is covered in water how much is actually fresh water and then of that how much can we access and use for drinking water and i mean that's a i didn't realize we were talking human scaling but that's what we were doing we said like this gallon jug is all the water and then this you know quarter of a cup is is all the fresh water and then this three drops from an eyedropper is what we can actually get to and use and that like kind of brought it to a scale that the kids you know, that's like, whoa, that's not much water. 
Um, and I think those, you know, I did, like I said, I didn't know it was human scaling at the time. Now I have a, a fancy title to put on it, but um, that we, we often try and an extension to kind of come up with very like simple uh, demonstrations of things that are, that we, we talk about in a larger scale and maybe we don't, we don't communicate it very well. I think um, I'm going to skip ahead a couple slides there, if you don't mind, Mara. One more. I think we're going to skip to here. Um, I, I want to have Dr. Lansing talk about this, um, the study he's recently completed about understanding perspectives of different audiences around responsible use of antibiotics. And um, what it told me is we don't necessarily know what our constituents do or don't know or what they believe. And maybe we're not even sending them the message that's really relevant. Uh, sure. Just basically, uh, we interviewed uh, a whole bunch of a range of people from consumers to farmers, extension agents, veterinarians, dairy buyers, even a butcher. And uh, we, from those interviews, we extracted 26 statements related to the question of what is responsible use of antibiotics in, in agriculture? And uh, we had them sort these statements based on their agreement or disagreement. And then from that, we were able to do what's called a factor analysis. And we extracted three significant factors. You can think of these factors as discourses around this question of what is responsible use of antibiotics. And uh, just briefly, the three discourses, we kind of gave them these names. Uh, there was a farmer first discourse, which essentially said uh, that the needs of the farm come first basically. Uh, and that's what's responsible use. So uh, like, you know, if the animal's in pain, the animal needs antibiotics, that sort of thing. Uh, this discourse had no consumers. It was uh, dominated by farmers. Unsurprisingly, there were a few veterinarians. A second discourse was uh, a public health centered discourse, basically the needs of the worries of antibiotic resistance and the needs of the public at large should determine what antibiotic use is done on the farm. And uh, this probably unsurprisingly had no farmers, <laughs> but it did have quite a few consumers. It did have some veterinarians and, and most of the public health experts we talked to were, were in there. Finally, there was a third somewhat idiosyncratic uh, discourse that we called libertarian pastoral. This, this discourse tended to disagree with any kind of regulation around antibiotics, like farmers should be free to use it. Government regulations are not effective. They agreed with statements like that. But also any kind of statement around uh, like antibiotic free farming is highly desirable. And we had various statements around that. They, this is, of course, tended to strongly agree with that. This also had a, a big, uh, the only one that had a mix of farmers and consumers, some veterinarians, no public health people were on there. What, what I guess I want to highlight here is what was interesting is if you look at some of these uh, ideas around what is a responsible use of antibiotics, there was no agreement across these three discourses. Right. So like ensuring animal welfare, the public health people said no, while well, the other said yes. Uh, they're, they're uh, you know, using it as a preventative. The farmer first people thought that was fine, but the other people did not. The only uh, consistent agreement across all three, which I wasn't expecting. And uh, I'm still right. We're still writing up the paper, so I'm not sure what to make of this. Uh, but I think some of what Kari said about the trusted authority, I kind of playing with this idea of the trusted translator. There was strong like veterinarians. We're, we're seen across all these divergent groups and people as if they if they decide it's responsible, then it's responsible. And this was true even among groups that would ostensibly disagree, like the public health uh, forward people and the, the farmer forward people. So I, I think, you know, as much as we've talked about people receive scientific information through their kind of preformed biases and, and whatnot, I think what this tells me is there's still a scope for kind of a, a certain trust and authority that can cut across different types of groups, especially concerning a topic like this, that it's not necessarily a hot button topic like global warming. People often don't think about antibiotics, at least consumers don't too much. And so, yeah, in this case, uh, despite the, there's quite a bit of divergence around what different people think is responsible, but convergence on one thing is that the, this one particular kind of expert is, is okay to listen to. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lansing. So the next slide is kind of um, my take home part, which is how in the world do we find time to create content that is creative and engaging? And, and you know, everybody told me when I started at UNL, it's like social media, you really need to be on there. That's where your clientele are going to hear you when you're out of the field day or you're doing this or that. And I'm like, I can't 
come up with a catchy tweet while I'm listening to somebody talk. And by the time I do, the moment has passed and then I just delete it. I'm not a social media person. I don't, I don't like it, but I hired people who like it. And we have a lot of people in our group that will take scientific information and create just a, a graphic about it. Something, even if you're only sharing one little point, maybe it'll bring a person back to the full article that we've written on that. Maybe not. That's okay. Most people aren't going to read, you know, lengthy articles. Um, but I thought I'd share some of the different tools out there that exist. Um, Canva is what we use. And Canva is an online, it's just canva.com. It's an online graphic design, publication design kind of application. And I decided like, if I could use that and make something look fairly decent, then anybody could use it because it's, there's templates, there's graphics, there's different fonts. It's really easy to move things and, um, you know, get ideas from, you know, you can see something you really like, but you're going to change it a little bit. So I really like Canva. We've gone to where we have Canva Pro. So we're paying the subscription fee, but it opens up some additional features like removing backgrounds from photos and things like that. Adobe Spark. I know some folks are better with the Adobe suite of applications. I am not. We have them. I know Amber, who she's the person who designed our programs for the conference. She's really good with Adobe Photoshop and all of those different tools. Um, so if you are an Adobe person, that may be a really good one. And then I found this Design Wizard and PicMonkey. Those are kind of a couple other free one, free online applications. But um, and there's another one that I just got an advertisement about the other day, and I can't. I was trying to think of it last night to to share with you, and I can't recall what it is, but it's um, it's similar to Canva. So it's kind of like free, come in, design it, and then you just download your design and do it, what you want with it. So to me, it's really important to have like really simple tools to make these outputs with. Otherwise, you know, you can't hire a graphic designer to do every flyer that you want to put out. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and skip over the next slide because I think we've talked a little bit about that. And it's, it's mainly that idea of you know, how do you engage in social media without losing your mind and getting in an argument when you really just want to share um, a message? And I think we'll kind of go to the just questions for the panelists now. Um, and if there's questions about social media and engaging on there, then they can certainly talk about that too. But anybody have questions or comments that you want to share? I hope you're not depressed anymore about people not, you are, we have one person still depressed that um, nobody listens to scientists. <laughs> um, other, anybody have some situations where you've tried different delivery methods and, you know, found out what works, what didn't work? Yeah. Thanks. I think Dr. Nixon touched on it with the medical example, but, um, you know, I've been scientist engineer for 50 years or so. And one thing that I've kind of gathered probably in the last few years is that People don't understand that concepts and science are not bright line things. They don't happen. You don't know it, and then you know it. It's a gradual process. Like in the medical example, climate change, continental drift. You know, when I was a student, was people were just figuring out that the continents had drifted apart. Um, and that that's important to communicate. The, the other comment I had was... Um, I do a lot of litigation support and convincing 20% of the people is not enough. I have to convince 51% of the people. So I, I've made a lot of notes. I appreciate it because I know how important it is to move from the data to convincing people who are non-specialists and who may have preconceived ideas. But uh, my target is 51%. I work with Dr. Dragon or Dr. Dragon, Dr. Sklash, and uh, a, an interesting thing about what your media might be and, and type of getting your your message across. And I, I recall him telling a story of one of the litigations that he was involved in, and there was a discussion about whether to use PowerPoint or whether to use a poster board because of the jury and the people that were there. And as I recall, it was a poster board that was used. And it was a much more effective way of getting the message across to that particular group of people. The, the other thing I'll say real quickly is we used a lot of the words expert here. And 
I don't like to use the word because does anybody know the definition of an expert? No. X is an unknown quantity and a spurt to drip under pressure. So I don't like to use that term because of how some people might view it. And I think a lot of people do view it when you come across as I'm the expert. So listen to me. So I think kind of taking that down a level so that people may not view you as that expert initially, but maybe by the time you're done with your talk, they think, hey, this person kind of knows their stuff. So oh, just a lot of things. And I've learned a lot from this gentleman about how you present and how you, how you dumb it down, if that's the right way to say it, to bring complicated technical issues down to a level that more people can understand. I just want to just add in real quick about the, it sounds like a little bit, you know, the, the litigation examples are talking a little bit about trial science and jury science and things like that, which are super interesting areas. Um, I've had some friends that have done consulting for, for a variety of law firms and trials and things like that. And it is a slightly different endeavor, I think. It doesn't mean that there aren't similarities, but I just want to mention that I think a lot of what I've been talking about wouldn't really apply in those litigation contexts because there you have a very specific purpose with a very clear set of parameters more often than not. Not that it's not challenging, not suggesting that it's not, but that that 51% goal, um, when you have that specific of a goal and that specific of an audience um, is certainly more attainable. And so I just want to make that sort of distinction between those two academic areas, because there is, we have, a, I mean, again, we, I'm happy to talk about it and talk about memory and, and sort of the, the, how memory really screws things up or the presentation in that sort of setting those things are all different and really important to keep in mind. But uh, for me, that's not been sort of the focus of what I've been trying to mention today, but it's, it's important work to talk about and consider in sort of in different contexts. All right. Thank you. Uh, another comment here. Um, this might be like at a very dumbed down level, but something that's been successful to me when I stand up and talk to producer groups, I work for our department of agriculture. Um, I had a colleague one time that had a t-shirt she wore quite often that said, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And I always just found that very comical. And so I like to just share that with my producer groups. Like I, I don't feel, or, you know, just try to let them know I'm not above you. I'm not telling you what to do. And I just use that joke. I'm from the government. So I'm here to help. And that helps. I've also seen that t-shirt worn by conspiracy theorists that are making fun of that perspective. So I would just like, again, like, thinking about sort of like what what can work it, it sounds no, like that really works for for your audience that and which is great uh but that again thinking about how that applies in different scenarios might might be uh might not always work and not to I, I feel like i'm just like constantly the pessimist where i'm like yep that's great but um and that is actually normally my role on these things so i guess that i'm just going to keep sticking sticking with that all right any other questions or comments Thank you, Dr. Lansing, Dr. King, Dr. Nixon for joining us. I really appreciate it. And um, you guys have a good rest of your day and uh, we'll talk again soon. Hey, great. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Thanks for your comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.